Hi, I'm Chris Ebinger, and welcome to Nightfall Audiobooks production of 99 Fear Street, The House of Evil, Book 3, The Third Horror by R.L. Stein. This is the conclusion of the 99 Fear Street trilogy, and after this I am open to suggestions on what I should be reading next. I would like to do some standalone R.L. Stein books, and I'll get to some trilogies later. Some of the trilogies I'm looking forward to are Silent Night, The Fear Street Sagas, and The Catalina Chronicles. Before I do all that and I start another trilogy, I want to read some standalone R.L. Stein, like Missing, The Wrong Number, 1 and 2, Halloween Party, Truth or Dare, Double Date, Bad Dreams. I really want to do The Cheater. A lot of these books are new to me, and I'm not familiar with them. I haven't read them before, so when I read them, it'll be my first time reading that book. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm on Twitter, at Nightfall Audio. You can also shoot me an email at nightfallaudiobooks at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. Any feedback is great. I release a new episode every Monday at 10 o'clock in the morning, Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you when this trilogy is over. Chapter 1 Cody Frazier raised one hand to her forehead to shield her eyes from the sunlight. The house appeared unchanged from the street. Several trees had been cut down and removed from the front yard, she saw, but the house and the lawn were still blanketed in heavy shade. Stepping onto the gravel driveway, Cody felt a chill. Two years, she thought. It's been two years since I said goodbye to this house. Two years since I said goodbye to my sister Callie, to my little brother James. Dead. Both of them. Murdered by this dreadful house. As Cody slowly made her way up the driveway, the shade swept over her, cold as an ocean wave. Her legs suddenly became weak. She tugged on the sleeves of her pale green sweater, then jammed her hands into the pockets of her white denim jeans and stared up at the house that had brought so much horror and pain to her family. 99 Fear Street The two-and-a-half-story house was nearly as wide as the yard. Its gray shingles were as stained and weather-beaten as Cody remembered them. The dark shutters were broken and peeling. Cody hesitated on the driveway. It's such a warm, sunny day, she thought, but the gloom of the house spreads over the front yard. The sunlight cannot break through. Taking a deep breath, Cody forced herself to move forward. The dark shingles on the porch roof were new, she saw, but the stained glass windows on either side of the front door were still faded and cracked. She stared at the large number 99 on the warped wooden door. Memories, frightening memories, made Cody stop again. As she stared up at the house, the front door slowly swung open. A girl stepped out from the darkness behind the door. She shook her blonde hair and smiled at Cody. Cody struggled to find her voice. She opened her mouth wide and gasped in shock and horror. The smiling girl stepped casually off the porch and waved. Callie, Cody called to her dead sister. Callie, it's you! Chapter 2 The girl flashed Cody a taunting smile. Callie, Cody called again, her voice a choked whisper. Cody, are you okay? The girl asked coldly. Not Callie's voice, Cody realized, and the girl's dark eyes were not Callie's eyes. All at once... Cody recognized Persia Bryce, an actress who was Cody's age, 18. Persia, you s surprised me, Cody stammered. Have you seen Bo? Persia demanded, not the least bit interested in Cody's distress. Persia's eyes searched the front yard, where workers on the film crew were busily stretching cables and setting up equipment. Still shaken, Cody stared at Persia's blonde wig. The hair, Cody suddenly realized, was actually much shorter than Callie's had been. No, I haven't seen Bo, Cody said softly. If you see him, tell him I'm looking for him, Persia instructed. She started jogging down the middle of the yard toward the row of trailers parked along the curb. Cody watched Persia until she disappeared into one of the trailers. Persia had been the star of a TV sitcom called Big Trouble. She had played Angela Trouble, the little girl in the sitcom family, but now Persia was grown and ready to try movies. She always seems so nice during TV interviews, Cody thought with some bitterness. She's always so sweet and modest always acts like a girl who's surprised by her success. Away from the cameras, Cody had discovered, Persia acted like a spoiled brat. She walked around with her nose in the air. Her expression said, Stay away from me, I'm a star. Persia had two assistants who followed her around as if they were on short leashes. She was always calling out orders to them and complaining when they didn't move fast enough. Months before, when Cody had been introduced to the actress at the casting director's office in Los Angeles, Persia greeted her warmly. It'll be fun working with you, actually playing you in this movie, Persia told her. We'll be playing sisters. 
and I hope we can get to be like real sisters. She's so nice, Cody had thought. Then a few days later, Cody learned that Persia had tried to have her removed from the movie. I don't want to work with an amateur, Persia had complained. Now, three months later, here they were in Shadyside, ready to start filming the movie of Callie and Cody's lives, 99 Fear Street. And Persia wasn't even pretending to be friendly. She always stared at Cody with a look of disgust, as if Cody were some sort of insect. And when they weren't rehearsing, Persia didn't say a word to Cody. She talked only to the director, Beau Montgomery, or to her two assistants. She pretended that Cody didn't exist. As Persia's trailer door slammed shut, Cody turned back to the house. Persia faded from her mind as Cody's thoughts returned to her dead sister. Callie, are you in there? She wondered. I promised I'd come back for you. Will I find you in there? Will I? I've got to make this picture work. This is my big chance. But Montgomery thought to himself. Gripping his clipboard in one hand, he stepped carefully over electrical cables in the attic, his eyes on a low ceiling. Can we light this room, or should we build an attic back in the studio? He asked the big man at his side, Sam McCarthy. Bo stared at the associate producer's round pink face and tiny blue eyes. McCarthy ran a hand over his stubby white hair. We can light it, Bo, he replied. We've already started setting up the green goo in the floor. I think we can work with this space. Behind his blue sunglasses, Bo narrowed his eyes at McCarthy. Think isn't good enough, Sam. You have to know. Bo tugged at the sleeves of his gray sweatshirt. Then he put an arm around McCarthy's beefy shoulders. You know what this picture means to me, Sam, he said with emotion. After the two last turkeys I made, I thought I'd never get to direct another movie. McCarthy snickered. Hey, I helped you make those turkeys, Chief. You don't have to remind me. Bo's expression remained serious. This film, 99 Fear Street, is my last chance. I've got to make this movie work, Sam. I can't let anything go wrong. McCarthy chewed on the unlit stub of a cigar he had wedged between his teeth. What could go wrong? he asked. Bo frowned. Plenty, he replied softly, staring around the narrow attic. For one thing, they're making me film in this run-down old house instead of the studio lot in L.A. It's great publicity, McCarthy interrupted. You're making the movie in the house where all the horrible stuff took place. Bo scowled and shook his head. The studio just doesn't want to spend any money, Sam. That's why they're making me film here. And that's why they stuck me with Cody Frazier playing Callie. I've got to use a total amateur in the starring role, because they were too cheap to get me a real actress. Bo sighed. This role has Winona Ryder written all over it. Instead, I get Cody Frazier. But you say Cody tested well, McCarthy protested. And she's had acting lessons, right? Bo didn't reply. Lowering his clipboard, he peered out the dusty attic window. You already got a spread in People Magazine because of the sister, McCarthy continued. It's great publicity, Bo. Cody Frazier returns to the House of Horrors to play her own dead sister. Maybe she'll be terrific. She's got to be, Bo replied heatedly. He tugged at his short ponytail. Let's check out the basement. As Bo led the way downstairs, a thousand thoughts bounced through his mind. Crew members he had to talk to, props to check, script problems to iron out, scheduling conflicts to be solved. Directing a movie was never easy, Bo told himself. It was even harder when the pressure was on, when everything had to go smoothly, when a career depended on it. As he and McCarthy explored the basement, Bo continued to think about all he had to do before shooting could begin. Lost in his thoughts, he didn't see the large gray rat scuttle out onto the concrete floor. He didn't see the second rat, its long whiskers twitching excitedly, scamper silently out to join the first. He didn't see the other rats creep out from the dark walls, and moved to form a tight circle around the two of them. The shrill chittering sound finally startled Bo from his thoughts. His eyes went wide behind the blue lens sunglasses. He grabbed McCarthy's arm and pointed. Sam, we're surrounded. The rat's eyes glowed in the darkness. The chittering sound became a shrill hiss. As if on signal, the rats tightened their circle and rose on their hind legs. The two men didn't have time to cry out as the rats leaped to the attack. Chapter 3 Uttering a startled cry, Bo swung the clipboard hard. It made a loud thwack as it connected with one rat. The stunned rodent went flying toward the wall. Bo spun around, pulled a fat rat from the front of his sweatshirt, kicked away another rat that had dived for his ankle. Beside him, he could see McCarthy flailing his big arms, ducking low, slapping a screeching rat off his leg. Run! Move it! Bo swiped at another hissing rat with a clipboard, catching it on the snout, sending it falling to the floor. Move! he screamed over the shrill, excited rats. 
He shoved McCarthy hard toward the stairs. They stumbled up the narrow steps, kicking rats off their sneakers, pulling them off their pants legs, up to the hallway, past several startled crew members, out to the front yard. Breathing hard, Bo stopped when he saw Cody Frazier in front of him on the walk. He could still hear the shrill hissing of the rats. He could still feel the prick of their claws on his skin. Bo, what's wrong? Cody demanded. Uh, we have a bit of a rat problem, he said, trying to sound as casual as possible. No need to get the actors all excited. He called to one of the assistants. Can you get an exterminator out here? Maybe two or three. Or ten. Cody shuddered, remembering the rats. Their evil red eyes and how they had once attacked her. She pushed the thought aside. Persia is looking for you, Cody told him. Bo sighed. He raised his clipboard and glanced at the top page. I'd better go see what she wants, he murmured. He gave Cody a quick wave and, forcing the leaping rats from his mind, jogged down the Persia's trailer. Cody, what's up? The voice made Cody turn. Rob Gentry, another actor, stepped toward her, his pale blue eyes trained on hers. Rob moved with an easy grace, thin but athletic looking. He was at least a foot taller than Cody. You okay? Well, Cody hesitated. Rob slid a comforting arm around her shoulders. She had known him for only a week, but Rob was warm and outgoing. He acted as if everyone were an old friend. He was always flirting with Cody, putting an arm around her, teasing her as if he had known her forever. I'll get you a cup of coffee, Rob said, guiding her toward the caterer's trailer at the bottom of the driveway. It must be really weird for you, being back here, I mean. Making a movie about your own life. He knows all about my life, about what happened to my family here, Cody realized. Everyone working here knows. They've all read the movie script. The caterers had spread a long table with sandwiches, muffins, salads, fruits, and all kinds of cold and hot drinks. The food was available to everyone on the crew from morning till night. The caterer's table was a very important part of movie making, Cody had quickly discovered. Rob poured himself a cup, then guided her away from the line of trailers to the next yard. He dropped onto the ground in front of a tall hedge and patted the grass, motioning for Cody to join him. He has such a great smile, Cody thought. Rob's eyes caught the sunlight. His auburn hair was long and wavy and brushed straight back. He's the handsomest boy I've ever met, Cody found herself thinking as she lowered herself onto the grass beside him. I didn't expect to feel so nervous, she told him. I'm all jittery. I'm nervous too, you know, Rob confessed, sipping the steaming coffee slowly. I mean, Anthony isn't exactly the biggest role, but this is my first film. Rob had done some TV acting and a few commercials, Cody knew. His father was a Hollywood studio executive. How else do you think I got this job, he choked when Cody had first met him. Persia is being so awful, Cody said, sighing. She orders me around as if I'm her dog. She's jealous, Rob replied, staring down into his cup. Huh? Persia? Jealous of me? Cody cried in surprise. Rob nodded. She wanted to play your part. She wanted to play your sister Callie. She doesn't want to play you. Cody let out a bitter laugh. Who would want to play me? She asked sarcastically. Rob sipped his coffee thoughtfully. Then he raised his pale blue eyes to her. You're not upset about Persia, he told her. You're upset about being back here at your old house where it all happened. I I thought I could handle it, Cody stammered, holding the cardboard cup between her knees. I mean, seeing the house again. But as soon as I stepped onto the driveway, all the memories, all the horrible memories came flooding back. It must be tough, Rob murmured, shaking his head. I could feel them, Cody continued emotionally. I could feel the memories, pushing me back, pushing me away from the house. Rob raised his eyes to hers. Cody realized she was breathing hard. She took a deep breath, then let it out slowly. So, why did you take the part? Rob asked with genuine concern. You knew it would be hard to face this place again, right? Cody nodded. Two reasons, she replied thoughtfully. One, it was such an incredible opportunity. I mean, my life was so terrible, Rob. My parents and I got as far away from Fear Street as we could. We moved to L.A., but our lives were ruined. She stifled a sob, took a deep breath, and continued. My dad was blinded by something in this house. He never regained his sight. And my mother, she was never the same after James and Callie died. I tried to forget it all. I finished high school. I went to acting school. I guess I was desperate to be someone else, anyone but me. And then I tried out for this movie. And they offered me the starring role. I, I had to do it. A station wagon filled with kids rolled past slowly. They all gawked at the row of trailers, the workers, and the movie equipment in the front yard. Are you a movie star? A girl in the back called out to Cody. Cody waved at a girl. The station wagon rumbled away. I had to do it, she repeated to Rob. I have a second reason. 
Her hand trembled as she raised the cup to her lips and took a sip of coffee. What? Rob asked, setting down his cup in the grass, leaning back against the hedge. I made a promise to my sister that I'd come back, Cody revealed. I saw Callie in the window, the front window, on the day my mom and dad and I left. I saw Callie, watching me from the window. Huh? Rob said it quickly, unable to hide his shock. But your sister was dead, he cried. Cody nodded solemnly. I know, but I saw her in the window, seeing her there, pressed against the glass, so lost and so sad. It's haunted me ever since. He placed a hand on her shoulder. She saw him staring at her thoughtfully. She knew he didn't believe her story. Who would believe it? She continued anyway. I promised Callie I'd come back. I promised her on that day two years ago that I'd come back and that I'd save her somehow. Goody sighed. So here I am. They were silent for a while. Then Rob climbed to his feet. He shook his head. Weird, he muttered. He started to say something else, but the assistant director called to him. He turned and trotted off toward the house. Cody took a last sip of coffee. She crumpled the cup in her hand and stood up. Brushing off the back of her white jeans, she made her way to the driveway. I should get my script and go over the scenes we're shooting tomorrow, Cody thought. Thinking about the next day, the first day of shooting made Cody's stomach feel fluttery. What if I can't do this, she wondered. What if the camera starts to roll and I freeze? The rehearsals back in Los Angeles had gone pretty well. Bo Montgomery was a very understanding director, very patient, very soft-spoken and kind. But sitting around a table, reading lines from a script, was a lot different from standing in front of a movie camera and acting with two dozen crew members standing around watching, Cody told herself. Cody could picture the gloating grin on Persia Bryce's face as she blew it. Well, I'm not going to blow it, Cody assured herself. She was so lost in her own troubled thoughts, she stumbled over a crate of special effects materials and nearly fell onto the driveway. Watch out! That box is filled with blood! A crew member shouted. Sorry, Cody murmured, stepping around it. Blood? Yeah. The movie will need lots of blood, Cody thought sadly. She remembered the night more than two years ago, when the blood started dripping from the ceiling in her parents' bedroom. The bright red blood, puddling on her parents' bed. Her father, her poor father, had hurried up to the attic to see what was causing so much blood to drip. He had returned, dazed and babbling, not making any sense at all, murmuring about three human heads, three bleeding human heads. Poor daddy, Cody thought. If only we had run out of the house that night. If only we had run out and never looked back. Halfway up the drive, Cody raised her eyes to the house and gasped. The living room window was curtained by shade, but even in the darkness, Cody could clearly see the figure in the window. She could see the girl's blonde hair, see her sad expression, see her hands pressed against the glass. Callie! Cody screamed. Reaching out with both arms, Cody ran toward the front door. The gravel spun out from under her shoes as she ran. She stopped at the front walk. Is it Callie, or is it Persia, she wondered, breathing hard. Have I been fooled again? Callie's ghost slid away from the window, floating back into the shadowy gloom of the house. The air pulsed around her. Sparks of dust rose up from the floor. Her eyes began to glow. Anger burst from her as a crackle of electricity. Workers in the next room cried out in surprise. A spotlight crashed. So my dear sister has returned, Callie declared to herself, slipping back to the window for another look. The gray light filtering through the dusty glass poured through her. She could feel herself shimmering in and out of focus. How long has it been, Cody? Callie's ghost wondered. How many years has it been since you abandoned me here? Since you went off to live life? Since you left me to this cold shadow world? I've lost all sense of time, Callie realized with a sob. There is no time for me. I'm outside of time. But now Cody has returned. Have you come searching for me, Cody? Callie wondered, unable to hold back her bitterness. No, you haven't. You've come back to be a movie star. You've come back to play the role you always wanted to play, haven't you? You've come back to play me. You're always so jealous of me, Cody. So jealous you were sick. And now you've gotten what you always wanted. You get to play me. You're going to be a star, right, Cody? You're going to be rich and famous, all because I died. All because you abandoned me to the evil of this house. Callie continued to stare out into the gray front yard. The workers had taken a break. They were clustered around the food table at the front of the driveway. Callie watched only Cody. She looks good, Callie thought. She let her hair grow. She lightened it so that it's my color now. Cody sees me, Callie realized, glowing with sudden excitement. The air sparked and crackled around her. Here she comes. Look at her, reaching out as if she wants to hug me. Look at her run. So eager. So eager. Will you find me, Cody? Yes, you will. Eventually. 
but you'll see that I've changed, dear sister. I've changed a lot. I am part of this house now, part of the evil. I am the evil, and the evil is me. You'll find that out, Cody, I promise you. You won't be a movie star, Kelly thought, shimmering in the rising dust. No, Cody, you won't be a movie star. But you will be famous, as the actress who died while making a movie about my life. Callie watched her sister run up the walk. Sliding through the shadows, the ghost moved to the front door. She heard Cody grab the doorknob, heard her start to push the heavy wooden door open. Directing her gaze, Callie made the door stick. Push as hard as you can, Cody, she urged silently. The door will not open. It obeys my will. I am the house, and the house is me. She heard Cody's surprise groan. Then she heard Cody give the door a hard shove. Put your shoulder into it, Kelly urged. Go ahead, shove. And now, here's a greeting from your long-lost sister, Kelly thought, summoning more evil energy. Kelly shot a dozen pointed steel spikes through the front door. She listened gleefully as Cody's shrill screams rose up in a wail of terror.